You mentioned we're in a big bubble. Can you elaborate on that, and how is this likely to play out? When you print money on the scale that modern nations are printing it, Japan, the United States, Europe, etc., we're getting into new territory in terms of size. There's never been anything quite like what we're doing now, and we do know from what's happened in other nations, if you try and print too much money, it eventually causes terrible trouble. And we are closer to terrible trouble than we've been in the past, but it may still be a long way off. I certainly hope so. When Volcker, after the 70s, took the prime rate to 20% and the government was paying 15% on its government bonds, that was a horrible recession. Lasted a long time, caused a lot of agony. I certainly hope we're not going there again. I think the conditions that allowed Volcker to do that without an interference from the politicians were very unusual. And I think in 2020 hindsight, it was a good thing that he did it. I would not predict that our modern politicians will be as willing to permit a new Volcker to get that tough with the economy and bring on that kind of a recession. So I think the new troubles are likely to be different from the old troubles. You may wish you had a Volcker-style recession instead of what you're going to get. The troubles that come to us could be worse than what Volcker was dealing with and harder like to fix. Think of all the Latin American countries that print too much money. They get strongmen and so forth. That's what Plato said happened in the early Greek city-state democracies. One person, one vote, a lot of egality, and you get demagogues, and the demagogues lather up the population, and pretty soon you don't have your democracy anymore. I don't think that was a crazy idea on Plato's part. I think that accurately described what happened in Greece way back then, and it's happened again and again and again in Latin America. We don't want to go there. At least I don't. We've done something pretty extreme, and we don't know how bad the troubles will be, or whether we're going to be like Japan or something a lot worse. And what makes life interesting is we don't know how it's going to work out. I think we do know we're flirting with serious trouble. I think we also know that some of our earlier fears were overblown. Japan is still existing as a civilized nation, in spite of unbelievable excess by all former standards in terms of money printing. Think of how seductive it is. You have a bunch of interest-bearing debts, and you pay them off with checking accounts, which you're no longer paying interest. Think of how seductive that is for a bunch of legislators. You get rid of the interest payments, and the money supply goes up seems like heaven. And of course, when things get that seductive, they're likely to be overused. If you stop to think about it, my way in life was not predicting little short-term differences between the Russell Index and the Standard & Poor's Index. I don't have any opinion about which index is better at any given time. I never even think about it. I'm always just looking for something that's good enough to put Munger money in. And I figure that I want to swim as well as I can against the tides. I'm not trying to predict the tides. If you're going to invest in stocks for the long term or real estate, of course there are going to be periods when there's a lot of agony and other periods when the, there's a boom. And I think you just have to learn to live through them. And as Kipling said, treat those two imposters just the same. You have to deal with daylight and night. Does that bother you very much? No. Sometimes it's night and sometimes it's daylight. Sometimes it's a boom, sometimes it's a bust. I believe in doing as well as you can and keep going as long as they let you. What impact has passive investing had on stock valuations? Oh, huge. That's another thing that's coming. We have a new bunch of emperors, and they're the people who vote the shares in the index funds. Maybe we can make Larry Fink and the people at Vanguard Pope. All of a sudden, we've had this enormous transfer of voting power to these passive index funds. That is going to change the world. And I don't know what the consequences are going to be, but I predict it will not be good. We have a hugely strong economy and a hugely strong technical civilization. And that's not going away. And the knowledge and so forth. And you can't believe what a modern factory looks like when you fill it with robots. And that's coming more and more and more. And it's coming to China too, for that matter. And so those trends are inevitable. And I think it does create adjustment problems. If you have a fine unionized job and they replace you with a robot, you've got a difficult problem. And if you've got a company like Kodak and they invent something new that obsoletes your product, you have a problem too and you solve that by dying. A lot of people don't like that solution. Because all those problems are real 
And because it's so tempting to get rid of your debt by just giving a guy a non-interest bearing checking account where you used to have to pay him interest every month, not only do we have a serious problem, but the solution to it that is the easiest for the politicians and for the Federal Reserve too, for that matter, is just to print more money and solve the temporary problems that way. And that of course is gonna have some long-term dangers. And we know what happened in Germany when the Weimar Republic just kept printing money, the whole thing blew up and that was a contributor to the rise of Hitler. So all this stuff is dangerous and serious and we don't want to have a bunch of politicians just doing whatever is easy on the theory that it didn't hurt us last time so we can double it and do it one more time and then we double it again and so forth. We know what happens on that everlasting doubling, doubling, doubling. You will have a very different government if you keep doing that enough. You're flirting with danger somewhere uh, unless there's some discipline in the process. But I don't regard Japan as in some terrible danger. I mean, they've done a huge amount of this and gotten by with it. I don't think we'll be as good at handling our problems as Japan is. If taxes were not an issue, what are your thoughts on going to cash today and waiting for better opportunities to deploy that cash over the next 12 months? Is it a sensible idea in your mind? In my whole adult life, I've never hoarded cash waiting for better conditions. I've just invested in the best thing I could find and I don't think I'm gonna change now. And the Daily Journal's used up its cash. Now Berkshire has excess cash, quite a bit of excess cash, but it's not doing that because it thinks it knows how to time investments. It just can't find anything it can stand buying. So we don't have a solution to your problem. We're just coping with it as I've described. Why is Berkshire not picking up or adding any new companies to its profile? Of course, kudos to the team in picking up Apple shares a couple of years back, that's paying off for sure. The reason we're not buying this, we can't buy anything at prices we're willing to pay. It's just that simple. Other people are bidding the price up. And a lot of the buying is not by people who really plan to own them. A lot of it is fee-driven buying. Private equity buys things so they can have more fees by having more things under management. Of course, it's a lot easier to buy something you use somebody else's money. We're using our own money, or at least that's the way we think of it. I've always believed that Nothing was worth an infinite price. Even an admirable place like Costco could get to a price where you would say that's too high. But I would argue that if I were investing money for some sovereign wealth fund or some pension fund and a 30, 40, 50 year time horizon, I would buy Costco at the current price. I think it's that strong an enterprise and that admirable a place. By the way, it's not a tragedy that Berkshire has some surplus money they're not investing. We look more responsible with the extra wealth, and we are more responsible with the extra wealth. The shareholders who are worried about the future because it looks complicated and difficult and they're hazard, I want to say to them what my old torch professor said to me, Charlie. He'd say, Charlie, tell me what your problem is and I'll try and make it more difficult for you. And he did me a favor by treating me that way. And I'm just repeating his favor to you. When you're thinking the thoughts you're doing, at least you're thinking in the right direction, you're worried about the right things. All you people that are worried about the inflation and the future of the Republic and so forth. Inflation is a very serious subject. You can argue that it's the way democracies die. When democracy dies in Latin America, inflation is a big part of it. So it's a huge danger once you've got a populace that learns it can vote itself money. If you overdo it too much, you ruin your civilization a lot. But of course, it's a big long range danger. If you look at the Roman Republic, even after they went to a empire with an absolute ruler, they inflated the currency steadily for hundreds of years. And eventually the whole damn Roman empire collapsed. So it's the biggest long range danger we have probably apart from nuclear war. I think the safe assumption for an investor is that over the next 100 years, the currency is going to zero. That's my working hypothesis. A very dangerous environment. What brought in Hitler was the combination of the Weimar inflation where they utterly destroyed the savings of the middle class in Germany, followed by the Great Depression. It was a one-two punch and Hitler came in crazy demagogue with 40% of the votes and pretty soon we had a dictator hell bent for world war. So the history is not pleasant. And Germany was a very advanced and civilized nation, the Germany that Hitler took over. I always well, say that the interesting well. thing about that was 
Little Albert Einstein, a little Jewish boy, got his entire primary education with the insistence of the Catholic Church in Germany. Now that is a very civilized nation. So if you let your nation deteriorate too much, what you get is a Hitler. We proved it. Of course, in a modern democracy in the age of Keynes, you're gonna get big government reaction. The reaction this time was bigger than it's ever been before in the history of the United States. They just threw money at the problem. And they were probably right to fear what was going to happen and to be quite liberal in throwing money at it, but they probably overdid it a little. They threw so much money so fast that it's hard for the restaurants to get people to do the work. But I don't criticize it. It's hard to make these decisions under pressure. Well, you have to be optimistic about the competency of our technical civilization. But there again, it's an interesting thing. If you take the last 100 years, most of modernity came in in that 100 years. And in the previous 100 years, that got another big chunk of modernity. And before that, things were pretty much the same for the previous thousands of years. Life was pretty brutal and short and limited and what have you. No printing press, no air conditioning, no modern medicine, no. I don't think we're going to get things that were in what I call the real human needs. Think of what it meant to get, say, first you got the steam engine, the steamship, the railroad, and a little bit of improvement in farming and a little bit of improvement in plumbing. That's what you got the 100 years that ended in 1922. The next 100 years gave us widely distributed electricity, modern medicine, the automobile, the airplane, the records, the movies, the air conditioning in the South. And I think what a blessing it was. If you wanted three children, you had to have six because three died in infancy. That was our ancestors. Think of the agony of watching half your children die. It's amazing how much achievement there's been in civilization in these last 200 years, and most of it in the last 100 years. Now, the trouble with it is, is, is that the basic needs are pretty well filled. In the United States, the principal problem of the poor people is they're too fat. That is a very different place from what happened in the past. They were on the edge of starving. And what happens is it's really interesting is with all this enormous increase in living standards and freedom and diminishment of racial inequities and all the huge progress that has come, people are less happy about the state of affairs than they were when things were way tougher. And that has a very simple explanation. The world is not driven by greed, it's driven by envy. And the fact that everybody's five times better off than they used to be they take it for granted. All they think about is somebody else has having more now and it's not fair that he should have it and they don't. That's the reason that God came down and told Moses that you couldn't envy your neighbor's wife or even his donkey. I mean, even the, the old Jews were having trouble with envy. And so it's built into the nature of things. It's weird for somebody my age because I was in the middle of the Great Depression when the hardship was unbelievable. I was safer walking around Omaha in the evening than I am in my own neighborhood in Los Angeles after all this great wealth and so forth. So, and I, I have no way of doing anything about it. I can't change the fact that a lot of people are very unhappy and feel very abused after everything's improved by about 600% because there's still somebody else who has more. Think of the pretentious expenditures of the rich. Who in the hell needs a real Rolex watch so you can get mugged for it, you know? I mean. Yet everybody wants to have a pretentious expenditure, and that helps drive demand in our modern capitalist society. My advice to the young people is don't go there. The hell with the pretentious expenditure. I don't think there's much happiness in it, but it, it does drive the civilization we actually have. It oh, drives the dissatisfaction. How will this all play out, and what's the best advice you have for individual investors to optimally deal with the negative impact of inflation other than owning quality equities? Well, it may be that you have to choose the least bad of a bunch of options. That frequently happens in human decision making. And the mongers have Berkshire stock, Costco stock, Chinese stock, Sulli Lu a little bit of Daily Journal stock, and a bunch of apartment houses. Do I think that's perfect? No. Do I think it's okay? Yes. I think the great lesson from the mongers is you don't need all this damn diversification. That's plenty of 
You're lucky if you've got four good assets. I think the finance professors and the sell the idea that perfect diversification is professional investment. If you're trying to do better than average, you're lucky if you have four things to buy. And to ask for 20 is really asking for egg in your beer. It's very <laughs> few people have enough brains to get 20 good investments. It's going to be way harder for the group that graduated from college now, for them to get rich and stay rich and so forth, it's going to be way harder for them than it was for my generation. Think what it costs to own a house in a desirable neighborhood in a city like Los Angeles. I think we'll probably end up with higher income taxes too and so on. No, I, I think the investment world is plenty hard and I don't think the, in my lifetime, 98 years, it was the ideal time to own a diversified portfolio of common stocks that updated a little by adding the new ones that came in like the apples and the alphabets and so forth. And I'd say the people got maybe 10 or 11% if you did that very intelligently before inflation and maybe 9% after inflation. That was a marvelous return. No other generation in the history of the world ever got returns like that. And I don't think the future is going to give the guy graduating from college this year nearly that easy an investment opportunity. I think it's going to be way harder. Some people are gifted enough that they can invest in hard to value difficult things. Other people, I think, would be very wise to have more modest ambitions in terms of what they choose to deal with. So I think you have to figure out your level of skill or the level of skill your advisor has, and that should enter the equation. But to everyone who finds the current investment climate hard and difficult and somewhat confusing, I would say welcome to adult life. The index funds of the S&P is like 75% of the market. So I don't think the exact problem you're talking about is going to be a big problem if you're talking about the S&P index. But is there a point where index funds Theoretically, they can't work a course. If everybody bought nothing but index funds, the whole world wouldn't work as people expect. There's also the problem, one of the reasons you buy a big index, like the S&P, is because if you buy a small index and it gets popular, you have a, it's a self-defeating situation. When the Nifty 50 were the rage, JP Morgan talked everybody into buying just 50 stocks. And they didn't care what the price was, they just bought those 50 stocks. And of course, in due time, their own buying forced those 50 stocks up to 60 times earnings, whereupon it broke and everything went down by about two thirds quite fast. In other words, you can, if you get too much faddishness in one sector or in one narrow index, of course you can get catastrophic changes like they had with the 50-50 in that former era. I don't see that happening when the index is three quarters of the whole market. The problem is the whole thing can't work perfectly forever, but it'll work for a long time. The indexes have caused just absolute agony among intelligent investment professionals because basically 95% of the people have almost no chance of, of beating it over time. And yet a lot of the people expect that if they have some money, they can hire somebody who will let them beat the indexes. And of course, the honest, sensible people know they're selling something they can't quite deliver. And that has to be agony. Most people handle that with denial. That they think it would be better next year. Or they just don't want to think about it. And I understand that. I don't really think about my own death either. But it's a terrible problem, meeting those indexes. And it's a problem that investment professionals didn't happen in the past. And what's happening, of course, is that the prices for managing really big sums of money are going down, 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 20 basis points and so on. The people who rose in investment management didn't do it by getting paid 20 basis points. But that's where we're going, I think, in terms of people who manage big portfolios of, of say, American equities and the equivalent of the S&P. So it's a huge, huge problem. And it makes your generation of money managers have way more difficulties than you. And it causes a lot of worry and fretfulness. And I think the people who are worried and fretful are absolutely right. I would hate to manage a trillion dollars in the big stocks and try and beat the indexes. I don't think I could do it. In fact, 
If you look at Berkshire, take out 100 decisions, which is like two a year. The success of Berkshire came from two decisions a year over 50 years. We're hardly great. It, we may have beaten the indexes, but we didn't do it by having big portfolios of securities and having subdivisions managing the drugs and subdivisions. No, the indexes are a hell of a problem for you people. But you know, why should shouldn't life be hard? It's what had to happen, what's happened now. If you take these people doing some of those early trading by computer algorithms that worked, then somebody else would come into the same thing with the same algorithm and play the same game. And of course, the returns went down. Well, that's what's happening in the whole field. Is the returns you're really going to get are being pushed down by the progress of the suns. The first rule of a happy life is low expectations. That's one you can easily arrange. And if you have unrealistic expectations, you're going to be miserable all your life. And I was good at having low expectations. And that helped me. Also, if when you get reverses, if you just suck it in and cope, that helps if you don't just fretfully stew yourself into a lot of misery. Then if there are certain behavioral rules, some of them, you know, Rose Blumkin had quite an effect on the Berkshire culture. And she had such a, she created a business with like 500 depression dollars that became a huge business. You know what her mottos were? Always tell the truth and never lie to anybody about anything. And those are pretty good rules and they're pretty simple. And a lot of the good rules of life are like that. They're just very simple. And do it right the first time, Lee Quinn. That's a really good rule.